Raúl Aguilar. Sí, pues. sí. Ahorita con los hijos, si no puedo hablar en español, permíteme. Este, la primera charla la va a dar el doctor Raúl Aguilar y lo vamos a presentar ahora. Este, y, 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 y me, we have a small eh, eh, speech about what he does in his laboratory and his career. So Raúl Aguilar, he, he studied in the Faculty of Medicine, Neuro, Neuro, he made a PhD in neuroscience uh, in the UNAM and then a postdoc at Robert J. E. Moore at the Neurology Department of Health Science Center. He's currently the head of the Laboratory of Circadian Rhythms at the Neuroscience Division of the Institute of Cell Physiology. His main interest is the study of circadian rhythms as a model to understand integrative physiology processes and behavior. Mm -hmm. His work focuses on the mechanisms of circadian rhythms in rodents. His current projects include the analysis of synaptic relations between the SSN, que se llama system, ¿cómo se llama eso? Supraquiasmatic. Núcleo. Núcleo. Núcleos supraquiasmáticos. Es que no, no sé qué quiere decir. The paraventricular núcleos of the thalamus and the identification of the ionic channels targeted by intracellular calcium as an output from the molecular drop in the supraquiasmatic neurons. And the neurons are the He is professor, se puede hacer en español. Sí, yes. He is professor of physiology at the School of Medicine at Luna. He has been president of the Mexican Physiological Society and founding president of the Mexican Biological Rhythm Society. He's actually the president. Uh -huh. He was director of the Human Health Research Program and member of the Human University Council. He organized and presides the, he organized and presides the Third World Congress on Coronabiology on behalf of the International Federation of Coronabiology in uh, 2011 in Puebla. He is member of the Mexican Academy of Science, Society for Research and Biological Rhythm, Society for Neuroscience in the United States. He is external reviewer for international journals, including the Journal of Biological Rhythm, Coronabiology International, European Journal of Neurosciences, Brain Research, Plus One and Constitution in Patrimony. He is currently in the editorial board of Constitution in Integrative Neuroscience. He has published six books, two of them international, 81 papers, all of them in text, 40 book chapters, 40 international and 10 scientific dissemination papers, more than 1,500 scientific citations. But his work has more than that. So I'm very happy to have him. He, we, we work at the same institute, he's my colleague uh, from the Neuroscience Department, and he has done always very nice work and very nice talks, and I'm very happy that he's with us today. Gracias, Alicia. Bueno, jóvenes, les tendré que hablar en inglés a petición del doctor Rudo Bujía, aquí presente. Este, ¿Por qué le gusta que los alumnos se hagan hombrecitos hablando en inglés? Creo que en esta ocasión tiene razón. So, I will proceed in English. And, uh, my talk is about the cellular and synaptic aspects of the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the rodent circadian rhythms. And by rodent, and I mean only rat and mouse. I know for a biologist, rodent is much more than those, but I only will refer to those two. So, today we're going to talk about what are the circadian rhythms and which is their, their neural regulation. Uh, our studies on the output pathway from the molecular circadian oscillator to the membrane of DSEN neurons. The space-temporal aspects of GABA as an excitatory neurotransmitter on DSEN. And some perspective for a future work. So, let's get uh, into business. Very brief, briefly, uh, circadian rhythms are basically daily variations in all or functions in the organisms, either plants, animals, or uh, even smaller uh, individuals. And here I show you the locomotor rhythm of, in a mouse to show you that uh, in this very few uh, 
10 days or so. We put the animal on their regular LD cycle a day in the summer with 10 hours of darkness and 14 hours of light. And we can see a very clear distinction between the activity, which is indicated by these very small black uh, boxes, uh, and the rest, which is shown by these horizontal lines. And you can see that the behavior distributes uh, in two, in, in, within these hours, which correspond to the uh, darkness hour, hours, and then, at some point, if we put them in constant conditions, free of environmental uh, queue times, uh, this time organization in the behavior persists. And that's what we call free running. And it's evidence that the origin of this rhythmicity, of this behavioral variation, is within the animal itself. Uh, Although that happened in natural conditions, these rhythms are aligned to the environmental dark, dark cycle, uh, either of long or short photo period. And this would have very important implications for adaptation of the, of the animals or the plants or the other organism we're talking about. So we can see that here where we put, we shift the uh, light onset six hours uh, after the original uh, time of, of, of dark onset. And you can see how the animal now starts its behavior around this time. And then we advance it for some hours, and uh, again, after some days, it uh, aligned again to this light dark cycle. And this process is what we call entrainment. Now here, I show you what happens when we put the animal, instead of constant darkness, here, we put it in constant light. And you can see that the rhythm still persists, but it has different characteristics. Uh, these differences are uh, explain what we call the ash of rules, which I won't go into details now. And we also know that we, if we put the animal in constant darkness, and then we give them a very brief light pulse, uh, the rhythm will either delay or advance depending on the time where we put or we administer these light bulbs. And this is what we call uh, the uh, phase response curve. If there are mathematicians here, this is a paradise for mathematical models particularly from the dynamic systems analysis approach. Now, these rhythms are generated by this set of neurons shown here in an easel staining. Uh, oops. Here, these are the SEN nucleus staining with, uh, with an easel uh, staining in a coronal section. That means if you are facing me and you put a guillotine going like this, you will see my brain, well, a little bigger, this is a rat brain, I hope. <laughs> and you will find the, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, as its name indicates, right above the optic eyes. Uh, these nuclei receive a very important input from the retina, and this is a replication of a very old experiment made by my mentor, Bob Moore, in the early 70s, where he put radioactivity into the posterior chamber of the eye and traced it down by what a technique called autoradiography into the SEM. So, uh, there's a part of the, of the uh, visual system uh, that goes into the hypothalamus. And this particular nucleus has two main populations of neurons. In brown are uh, neurons which present vasopressin, and in blue, or dark, uh, dark blue or black, is neurons presenting basointestinal uh, poly uh, polypeptide. These two peptides can describe completely the whole SEM. 
and this is uh, a horizontal section. So this is through the toward the tail, and this is toward the no nose of the animal. And, uh, very early studies show that when we lesion this nuclei, uh, we we lose rhythmicity, disappear completely, and then uh, when you put fetal SEM grafted into the, the third ventricle of these lesion animals, the rhythm restores. And this is a, a long follow-up of this uh, effect, and you see how the rhythmicity slowly is being restored, then we put the animal some days into a uh, light dark cycle, and then release again into constant darkness, and then you can see how it really shows up the rhythmicity recovery. And this is just the pathology showing that there's a piece of tissue in the third ventricle, this shouldn't be here, which has this uh, cluster of VIP neurons, which characterize the SEM. I don't show it here, but uh, in this area there were some vasopressing neurons. These neurons uh, function as a self-sustained circadian pacemaker, and you can see that there's a day-night difference in the neuronal firing rate recorded in vivo and in vitro. These are from acute brain slices, uh, but these are from, from Repert lab, uh, an early work from Repert lab, you can hear it uh, this afternoon, where he uh, dissociated and cultured SEN neurons uh, on the top of this matrix of electrode tips, so he can record at the same time up to 64 neurons. And in this example, I show you how, uh, through three days of recording, you can see the rhythms of individual neurons. So, even in vitro and dissociating from each other, the SEN neurons can have a circadian rhythmicity. Now we know, using some genetic engineer techniques, that uh, if we look to the uh, PER2 gene, uh, which we, you will hear about it uh, a lot later, uh, uh, in a construction which is uh, promoting the expression of uh, luciferase, uh, which is the enzyme which uh, induces light uh, emission in fireflies, I think. Less. Come see, man. I just mean you have to respond. Luciferase. Uh, every time that the pair uh, gene or, uh, is uh, transcripted, it goes to the luciferase. So we can see, act we actually can see the neuron glow. And this is a recording of this uh, glowing uh, in a particular chamber through several days. And you can see that even at the uh, metabolic level, there's a very clear rhythm uh, of uh, SEN activity in vitro. Uh, this is a simplified model of the circadian system and the molecular oscillator. We will have a lot of information about this, so I won't go much into, into this uh, data, but basically there are two genes, pear and cry, that they are uh, uh, trans Right. transcribed uh, by, by effect of two proteins, BMAL and CLOCK, which act on an EBOX promoter in the regulation uh, region of these genes, which leads to the production of the corresponding proteins, which then go back into the nucleus through a, a processing uh, pathway, and when into the nucleus, they displace these two uh, Trans inductores de traducción, de, perdón, de transcripción. He, he induces it, uh, he displays it, so it stops its own uh, transcription. And this is the basic molecular oscillator, as I like to call it. And it also shows that if this is an SEN neuron, there's a, there are entrainment uh, pathways, mainly to light, but to other stuff as well, to other stimuli, 
which synchronize these cells, and there are driving pathways from these neurons to the rest of the brain. We will hear part of them in Dr. Bush's uh, talk a bit later. Uh, but this model is very important to distinguish between this input and this output. Basically, what is important for you to remember to understand my uh, next slides is that this pathway leads to modify the expression of the uh, clock genes rhythm. While this pathway, if we manipulate them, won't have any effect on the clock genes, but it, ha it, it may have very important effects on the rest, on the output of these clocks. Okay? So let's talk about this uh, uh, output pathway uh, from the molecular circadian oscillator to the membrane of the SEN neurons, and particularly how it's the membrane excitability uh, regulated. And we have it here in a cartoon where this, this means this. The very complex molecular oscillator is uh, simplified to this uh, cartoon. So our question is, what is what connects this oscillator to this rhythm of uh, neuronal firing rate, which are the pathways which connect? And uh, through a lot of evidence, which I won't review today, but in those who were uh, Dr. Mauricio Diaz was uh, very deeply involved. Actually, he taught me into studying calcium, intracellular calcium. I used to do other stuff. We came to the hypothesis that the output pathway could be intracellular calcium. So we made several experiments, and these are the key ones. We now know that dryanodine release can release uh, calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum through a dryanodine sensitive channel, which is called RIR. And we can see here the levels of intracellular calcium uh, as reported by, by, by a calcium reporter. Uh, and when we open the channel, these are the basal conditions of several neurons, when we open the channel with this low dose of, of uh, ryanodine, 100 nanom, uh, nanomolar, there's an immediate increase in the free calcium levels at the cytoplasm. And when we close this uh, channel, this one, <coughs> by using dantrolin, uh, these are the calcium levels in the cytoplasm, the free calcium levels in the cytoplasm. When we analyze individual neurons, we see a very uh, interesting pattern. Most of the neurons with this dose, with the low dose of ryanodine, has this pattern, increase in the calcium levels, free calcium levels. But there are some that do not respond and some that actually go the other way. But most of them are releasing calcium from the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And when we close the, 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 the channels, we have the same. We have a large number of neurons which decrease the levels of calcium, uh, uh, intracellular calcium, but there are a number of neurons which do not respond and another neurons which go the other direction. Uh, we then manipulate these uh, ryanodine-sensitive calcium channels uh, and determine its effect on the firing rate. And we can see that if we apply uh, to this neuron, which was uh, firing very slowly, uh, we block all the synaptic activity within the brain slice. These are in vitro studies, making in brain slices. When we block all synaptic activity, so practically we have isolated pharmacologically each neuron from the rest of the circuit. Uh, and then we apply uh, 100 nanomolar of ryanodine 
the, the file rate increased to this very high frequency. This is a night, uh, night firing pattern, and at that time we go to a very clearly, very distinctly day firing pattern. And the opposite happens when we close the, the channel. This is the basal recording. We, we block the, the synaptic activity. We have basically no effect. And then when we close with 8 micromolar ionodine, we decrease the firing rate. This is the same neuron. And you can see that the effect is really striking. So we then move to determine the, whether this has to do with the expression of the ryanodine channels. We know it depends on the calcium released from the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, but we want to corroborate what was uh, uh, previously described by Pfeffer in 214, uh, that there was a circadian rhythm in the messenger levels of the ryanodine 2 channel in the SEM. We did it in individual cells by quantitative PCR. And what we found that uh, as a population, there was a clear day, night, difference in the levels of expression of the uh, ryanodine channel. But when we look at the individual data, we have a very uh, 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 heterogeneity uh, in the neurons. We have neurons that were uh, with high levels of the proteins, but also neurons with low levels. Most during the day, most of them were in, in, the, in the upper part. But uh, in the night, we have the opposite. The, most of the, of the neurons has low levels of, of, of expression of the protein, but there were some that has the high levels. And this could explain the difference what, that we found when monitoring individual calcium intracellular levels in, 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 in the previous experiment. So, we came to the uh, crucial evidence that this was on the output of the clock. Uh, what we did was to monitor the PER2 expression, which, as I told you, is one of the core uh, genes in the molecular clock. If the ryanodine, as we play with it, was in the input to the clock, we would expect a difference in the phase of the rhythm after the treatment with ryanodine. But if it was in the output of the molecular clock, we won't have any effect on the gene clock. And that's exactly what happened. These are uh, let me, let me remind you, oops, no, yo, y alguien me ayuda donde anda el cursor, lo ven, ya lo vi, we take this recording, and then, And then we split it into days and put one on top of the other. So we identified the peak of the rhythm as a phase maker, marker. And we did it before, during the baseline, and then after the treatment with either 100 nanomolar or 18 micromolar of ryanodine. As I showed you before, this would release calcium an increased finding rate, and this will uh, close the channel, the calcium disappears, and then the firing rate decreases. But we have no effect in the phase of the clock gene. You can see here, 
uh, studying a, a, a number of, of, of slices, uh, uh, repeating these experiments, these are individual examples, that there was no actual effect on the face. So, this demonstrates that the calcium, intracellular calcium, uh, the free cytoplasmic calcium, released from uh, mainly endoplasmic reticulum deposits through the Ryanodin type 2 channel, are modulating the excitability of the membrane, which leads to change in the neuronal firing pattern, and also uh, change, on, but only transiently, the behavioral rhythms. I didn't show you this data for time uh, restrictions. We have looked into these channels as possible targets of the uh, free calcium, cytoplasmic calcium, but our data is inconclusive. It, it really sometimes goes up and goes down, so, so we decided to look for another channel involved. And this leads us to the hypothesis that anoctamines could be uh, involved in this process because these are calcium-regulated chloride channels. And basically, there are only potassium uh, and chloride channels which are regulated by intracellular calcium. I haven't found in neurons other ionic channels which can be regulated by calcium. So we decided to test this hypothesis. And we, what we found very recently was that actually the protein and noctamine and the messenger is present in the SEN neuron. So I'm showing you here some uh, uh, staining with the anoctamine uh, uh, antibody. And here we use the uh, control peptide provided by the, by the company where we purchase the, the antibody. And you can see that uh, the peptide blocks uh, the fluorescence this uh, of this uh, channel so we we run uh, with another antibody some western blood uh, uh, studies each of these lanes of the S from the SEN are from pools of five uh, five individual SENs and we control with a positive tissue like the liver uh, and the kidney and with a negative control which is the muscle and we then showed that the messenger levels uh, were uh, <coughs> clearly expressed in SEN neurons. This is a, a calibration curve uh, made from, from, from kidney to have enough uh, of RNA material. To, uh, and then this is compared to the SEN micro dissection. Uh, uh, to the levels of mRNA uh, from uh, microdissected SEN, and you can see very clearly that there are uh, uh, good levels of this uh, messenger. So this uh, shows us very clearly that the channel, the chloride, uh, calcium-regulated channel, anoctamine one, is present there. We have also tested the anoctamine two chloride channel which is also present there, but we haven't drawn all the uh, mRNA uh, uh, studies, so I will show you those data. So, we will move now. So, this is a neat uh, story from a point of view, because it shows that in this uh, diagram, we eventually could put as a possible target of the calcium to a chloride channel. So we'll talk now about the excitatory effects of the GABA in the SEN, and particularly the space-temporal uh, manifestation of this effect. There was a lot of controversy whether 
GABA was excitatory in the SEM. Some groups say it does. Some others say it doesn't. Uh, some say it was during the day. Some others say it was during the night. So it was a kind of mess. So we decided to re-examine re -examine this, uh, this issue by uh, studying uh, these, uh, the, the GABA equilibrium membrane potential through the SEM in the space. And at two different times, midday and midnight. And we find out was that when we sort the neurons, we, we, we studied a very large number of neurons by this perforated patch technique, which is kind of complicated. We get up to 200 neurons, about 200 neurons uh, sample. When, with this sample size and sorting the, we sort the neurons by place and time of recordings, this pattern arises. In the dorsal SEM, during the day, the uh, GABA equilibrium potential was quite depolarized. But during uh, the night, the equilibrium potential moves to the regular GABA equilibrium potential. Uh, this makes the, the GABA inhibitor. Given the uh, gr chemical gradient of chloride inside and outside the membrane. On the other part, in the ventral part of the SEM, during the day, the levels of the, the E GABA levels were hyperpolarized, but during the night, it was depolarized. So this was burning and was just a first approximation. This is a general analysis, space analysis and time analysis of this pattern. So what this data shows that is that everybody could be right. It depends when and where in the SEM they make the recordings. But nobody gives detailed information about this issue. So we cannot tell from reading the previous papers. When we put a, a blocker of the chloride transporter NKCC1 into a sample of the previous neurons, uh, which showed a, a, a depolarized E GABA potential. We found that blocking this transporter, all neurons became a regular hyperpolarized GABA potential, GABA reversal potential. Uh, so it means that this channel uh, pump chloride into the cytoplasm, shift the uh, uh, equilibrium potential of chloride towards the resting potential, and given the uh, co correct conditions, when GABA binds its receptor, it will lead to depolarization. So GABA will be excitatory which is quite unusual in the adult neurons. This is more or less common in some uh, fetal neurons during development. But the GABA became uh, inhibitory in, in all these uh, re other regions of the SEM, of the mammalian SEM, except in some cases of epilepsy or in the in the case of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is the first, to my knowledge, this is the first example that in physiological conditions, GABA has excitatory effects in the central nervous system. And we kind of make a cartoon with a table showing time and space. And basically, the difference here is the number of these uh, purple dots which represent the chloride transporter. So the effect, the GABA effects depend on a balance between the GABA receptor, a chloride channel. GABA receptor is a, a chloride channel, is a ligand-driving chloride channel, and the 
uh, chloride transporter, which pumps chloride into the mirror. So this uh, leads us to, to question whether anatamine, which is another chloride channel, could be involved in this, uh, also involved in this excitatory uh, GABA effect. And kinds of it's putting together two originally independent lives, lines of research from my laboratory. And there are some other data we will not show about the relation between, between the paraventricular thalamic nuclei and the SEM, which also make this, all these GABA uh, chloride calcium regulated channels very relevant for the future. So what we're moving forward is to uh, uh, determine whether noctamines contribute to the firing rate of the SEM neurons so far, we just have shown that it, it is there. We have to uh, answer this question very carefully. We have to determine whether these channels participate in the output pathway, as I uh, indicated in one of my cartoons. And finally, we were very interested in determining whether the uh, anoctamines contribute to the excitatory effect of GABA in the SEN neuron network. And very importantly, in the space and time domains. So, this is it. Thanks for your attention. And we invite you to do your thesis at my lab in any of the previous subjects or probably other related to these matters. Thank you very much. And there's my email. Please call me. I'll be waiting. I'll be desperately waiting for you. Thank you very much. I think we have a lot of time for several questions or comments. Who wants to? No. You already read the papers. <laughs> it's clear that you have already read the papers. VIP <laughs> is the neuromodulator involved in uh, coupling different neurons in the SEN among themselves in particular regions and even between regions uh, within the SEN, ventral versus dorsal SEN. And if you knock down the VIP receptor or VIP genes, you uh, uncouple individual neuronal oscillators. And the whole SEN doesn't show rhythmicity. Uh, but individual neurons, if you follow them, they still have some rhythms, although weak. So, as you already know, they are very, very important. But I'm not interested in that particular part. Because for me, even the dwarfs started very little. So the, the first point is what happens between this TTL loop, the clock genes mechanism, and the membrane. And this is just within one SEN unit. So that's the, the question we want to address first. There are other levels of organization that can be, that these questions could be addressed. But at this time, I'm not interested in those. In the, in the <coughs> In that graph where you show the, uh, in the graph where you show the, is it the expression in individual neurons? 
why did you choose to do it in individual neurons instead of the whole SCN? Um, did you ever do, uh, with like in those neurons, uh, PCRs for clock genes so that you could correlate Uh, José Luis, ¿medimos clock genes en esas células? No, we didn't do it, uh, because at that particular moment, we didn't have the, the, the props, the oligos to, to do it. Now we can do it, but, sorry? It would be very interesting as a first step to link Uh, we we well we ha we have to prove it, but I'm not really deep into answering that particular question, because it has been shown that at any particular time, SEN neurons, individual SEN neurons, have different phases. So even during the night, there are some few neurons which are firing very high, and the clock genes are expressing very high. And uh, at the mid of the day, there are some neurons which are firing very low, and the clock genes are, are, are very low as well. So I think with that we can trust in those previous data, and our data goes along those lines of evidence. So of course we can go into that tiny question. But for me, it's a very tiny question. I want my dwarf, 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 to grow. I don't want to see him is an, at an embryonic state, which is your approach. I want to see him grow to a full-size draft. Okay? So I want to move forward in that sense. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, those were, those were the starting point, which I mentioned very early in the introduction to this topic. We first measure the protein levels of ryanodin at the whole SEM. We make micro punches of the SEM and measure the levels of the protein. And we found a very clear day-night difference as a population it stands what we saw at the mean levels of the individual neurons. So we did that. Thank you very much for reminding me. And we also me measure the IP3. We look into the IP3 calcium channels, but those doesn't have circadian rhythms. That's why we lost interest in those at the very early stage of the, our research. Although it, they are very important to amplify this signal, to a higher level to drive to actually drive the firing rate by intracellular cars. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mauricio. Thanks. I have a commercial question. Do you have any model of the mathematical illustration about cutting of the ensemble uh, nowadays? So maybe it could be I don't, but there are several models. In the game. Actually, you were working on one of those when you were making your no, because, uh, uh, dissertation. I have, I have found several different approaches to yeah. copying, but uh, I, I don't know. It, it is important to have new results of experiments to introduce. But I mean, only the illustration, the cartoon of a, a possible copy of uh, several theories. There are several models. Some people uh, in the other There are several. I don't follow them very closely because, as you know, you. maths are not my my strength. Okay. Let's put it that way. <laughs> that level of maths, I mean, I can add. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions or comments? work with uh, any neurons. So the data that you are showing uh, shows that the circadian rhythm is coded with the 
developmental program of the neuron, right? So I am interested in knowing if there is some epigenetic marks or some epigenetic uh, phenomena that could be implicated in this circadian rhythm. Well, uh, you're interested in development, is that correct? In the epigenetic control of the uh, this Well, that's a question for Lorena. I hope she can answer it. Or, or she's in a much better position to talk to you about epigenetics than I am. But I can tell you that I would rephrase your question on why in the SEM humans genetic programs from fetal to adult neurons does not switch off, which seems to be happening, at least in the GABA as a neurotransmitter. Most neurons switch from excitatory to inhibitory uh, GABA septic uh, properties during development, but not in SEM, which are the genes that are not switched off and which could be the epigenetic and I don't know whether it would be epigenetic because I, as far as I know this is the regular program hasn't been uh, programmed in any way because of uh, motherhood environment early uh, embryonic or fetal development which is what I expect the epigenetic uh, programs uh, to operate but I found your question quite interesting. Yeah, it's a very important question. Thank you. Lorena, you have to... No? Is there any other question or comment? Well, then we thank Dr. Aguilar.